Welcome back everybody. Today, we're gonna to go back to expanding on the process abstraction that we started with at the very beginning of the course. We're gonna look at how the operating system and the application communicate through an interface known as the system call interface and a little bit into how this is implemented. And then finally, look at some of the other processor facilities that are very related to understand how different processes can be scheduled and the mechanisms that actually enable this. So here we have an example, a really coarse grain diagram of an application or a single process running. And the way that it communicates is through this system call interface. The application calls a function that's typically inside of the library, some kind of library, libc in many operating systems. And that library then implements the system call, call, and the kernel gains control of the processor, is able to execute on behalf of the application the requested call, and then returns the response back to the application. So let's see a little bit about how all of this comes together. System calls, broadly speaking, are the application programmer interface or API that allows a programmer to interact with the raw operating system. Not all of the functions you call are necessarily system calls. A given thread within a process can invoke a system call and common examples that we've already seen in previous lectures are fork, wait PID, open, close, read and write are all examples of system calls. Some system calls can be incredibly complex. So syscuttle, which is used in numerous Unix operating systems to expose operating system configuration, and ioctl that's typically used to control devices. What we need out of our system call interface and out of the hardware is a mechanism to safely enter and exit the operating system kernel. We don't want the application to be able to call just any kernel function directly. And we want the kernel to be able to always enforce its protection mechanisms on the application. So this brings us to a little bit of a review of what you should have seen in your hardware course. Hardware is gonna provide, as we mentioned in earlier lectures, multiple operating modes. And typically there's at least two modes, a kernel mode or privilege mode and a user mode. The kernel mode is special in that it can access pretty much every feature of a processor. It has access to all kinds of restricted features that are only meant for the operating system, the ability to enable and disable interrupts, control the system call interface, and modify the behavior of virtual memory that we'll get to in a subsequent lecture. The combin combining these mechanisms allows the kernel to protect itself and isolate itself from the process. And we're gonna ensure two basic properties, that processes cannot read and write kernel memory, and that processes cannot directly call just any kernel function. They're only allowed to call functions that the kernel has exposed to the application. So let's look a little bit about how this mode transition occurs. Kernel mode is only entered through these well-defined entry points. And how this is done is a little bit specific to each processor, but generally there's two ways that the uh, kernel can gain control of the processor. The first is interrupts. Interrupts are externally generated events. These are events coming from devices like the keyboard, the mouse, and we'll get to talk about this in more detail in the future IO lecture. And exceptions. Exceptions are internal errors, usually caused by the program that was executing. So divide by zero, a page fault because some virtual memory isn't present, or some internal CPU error are all examples of exceptions. Both interrupts and exceptions cause hardware to control, to transfer the control of the processor to a specific interrupt or exception handler. This is just a fixed entry point inside the kernel and it'll enable all the privileged features of the kernel 
of the processor so that the kernel can actually do its work on behalf of the application. Interrupts are from external sources. These are usually devices that are attached to your processor. Interrupt handler is the function inside the kernel that is gonna service a particular device request. Typically, the way this works is that a device will signal to the processor with one or more physical pins or messages on various types of buses to tell the processor that an interrupt needs to be raised. The processor will then stop the current program and switch into privilege mode and give control to the interrupt handler. Most interrupts can be disabled, and this is used during the implementation of spin locks as we saw in the previous lecture, but not all. There are non-maskable interrupt sources that are usually there for urgent system requests. This could include power issues, thermal issues in your system that cannot be masked and the pro operating system needs to handle these immediately. Exceptions, or sometimes referred to in some systems as faults, are conditions that are encountered during the execution of a program. Exceptions can occur for a variety of reasons. Some of these are program errors, like divide by zero or an illegal instruction. Some of these are operating system requests. When we talk about virtual memory, we'll see that the page fault is a type of exception allowing the OS to service virtual memory requests. And hardware errors. The processor sometimes detects that something's wrong with memory or even the CPU itself or device and triggers an exception to notify the system that one of these things failed in the process of executing a program or the operating system itself. The CPU handles exceptions in a very similar way to interrupts. The processor again stops the instruction, typically at the instruction that generated the exception, and then the control is gonna be transferred to some fixed location exception handler that's located in privilege mode. So we'll switch into privilege mode and run some, some function that the kernel's defined and give it control and the ability to service this request and try to fix up whatever occurred and then continue executing the program or terminate the program in some cases. System calls are a class of exceptions. Note that in some processors, system calls will have a customized path for performance, but nonetheless, they look a lot and behave like any other exception path. So in MIPS, we have a bunch of exception vectors that can be triggered by the processor. We have the, the first vector is the interrupt, since they have a common path for interrupts, exceptions, and system calls. And then we see a lot of other kinds of errors. All of these TLB errors we'll see when we talk about virtual memory, these address errors on load and store, bus errors because of an instruction fetch or, or other kinds of errors, breakpoints for debugging, and in the middle here, system calls. And this is the main focus of today's lecture, is going to look at this system call exception, but we'll, talk, we'll mention one example using an interrupt later in the lecture as well. System calls, as we mentioned, are the API between the application and the operating system. System calls are performed by triggering this exception syscall, and the way this happens is usually by using the system call instruction. First, the application loads the arguments into a set of CPU registers and possibly on the stack if they're more than allowed by the, the ABI. Second, the system call number gets loaded into register V0. And then finally, the system call instruction, the syscall instruction in MIPS is executed that triggers the system call exception. Many processors include similar instructions. So even on x86, the architecture you have on most of your computers, there's the syscall and also sysenter instructions that are used to trigger system calls. Let's look at how the exceptions are implemented by the hardware. So here we're gonna look at the MIPS R3000 
which is the variation of the MIPS architecture that SIS-161 attempts to emulate. There are two exception handler addresses that are both at fixed locations. They're shown here as these two addresses. This corresponds to the two gigabyte boundary memory and two gigabytes plus 128 bytes for the second, the general exception handler. The first one, we'll get to see more about this in future lectures, is used by virtual memory. The TLB, the piece of hardware that maps virtual to physical memory, is reloaded by the operating system through this software routine. And this can happen very frequent in demanding applications. And so this exception handler is typically written as a hand optimized assembly routine for a fast path and then fall back to a slower path for anything that doesn't fit this sort of uh, fit through the fast path. The general exceptions are handled generally through a function that's written in C. Remember that there's a reason that both of these addresses are at the two gigabyte boundary, and that's because the first 512 megabytes of physical memory in the processor is gonna be mapped at this address. This is essentially where the operating system and the kernel reside. All the memory above the two gigabyte boundary is typically used by the operating system and everything below is virtual memory that the application uses. We'll see more about this when we get to the virtual memory lecture. Also, in the MIPS architecture, there are a, one or more coprocessors and the two most common ones, CP0, is known as the system control coprocessor that provides all the privileged mode architectural features to the operating system. And it also provides control and management of the translation look aside buffer, the TLB for virtual memory. CP1 is the other common coprocessor, which is typically used by the floating point unit. The coprocessor has a bunch of registers and some instructions for moving data to and from these registers. There are five key registers that are used by OS161. C0, coprocessor zero, underscore status, which has the CPU status that tells us whether or not we're in the kernel mode or in user mode. C0 underscore cause, which tells us what caused the exception. This will contain the exception vector, whether it was a syscall, an IRQ, or a TLB miss, or what was what operation caused this. C0 underscore EPC, which is the program counter when the exception occurred. And C0 underscore VAdder, which is the virtual address associated with the fault. This is used for the TLB fault specifically that we'll come to in future lectures. And C0 context, which is used by the operating system to store some metadata to identify the current processor. In OS161, this stores the CPU number that can then be used to look up any local CPU parameters. Let's briefly recap the system call operation in detail, and then we'll review the ABI that we saw in earlier lectures, and then try to put all this together to see how the entire thing works for a system call and a full task switch when an interrupt happens due to a timer. First, an application usually initiates the system call by calling one of the function calls provided by a library. So we call into the C library in this case for the call write. Write is a system call and the library, all it does in return is that it calls the syscall instruction. The kernel executes its exception handler at the two gigabyte plus 128 byte address. And what this is going to do is this is gonna switch from the user stack into the kernel stack and set up all of the processor state to prepare it to run kernel code. It's gonna create a trap frame. A trap frame contains the program state or what we'll refer to later as a context. 
it's going to then determine the type of exception or system call, determine which system call was executed, and then run the corresponding kernel function on behalf of the application. In this case, it'll be sys underscore write. Once this completes and a return value is returned, then we can restore the application state using the trap frame. The trap frame captured all of the application state that was necessary. It will be restored, all of the registers, and then return from the exception to user space, taking away all of the privilege mode features and allowing the application to continue running safely. The library are just wrapper functions that return the value then back to the application itself. So as I mentioned, let's look a little bit at the calling convention so we can see where all the values are stored throughout this process. Again, as we mentioned in earlier lectures, what defines the calling convention is the application binary interface. This is the contract that functions inside of the application and system calls are held to. The compiler and the operating system has to obey these rules. MIPS and OS161 in general use the MIPS calling convention for 32-bit MIPS processors. The system call will be placed in V0 and the first four arguments will be placed in A0 through A3. All the remaining arguments can be placed on the stack. After a successor failure, two values are returned. A3 will contain a successor fail and the return value or the error code will be placed in V0. In a success case, we simply return the return value V0 to the application. And in the fail case for most system calls, the value inside of V0 will be saved into a global variable for the application known as error no. The system call numbers are defined by the operating system. The operating system defines them in OS161. This is inside of kern include kern syscall.h that contains a table of all the system calls that are possible. There are many more, but the basic calls in OS161 are shown above and they simply just have integers that correspond to each system call that you can call. And the calling convention, as we mentioned in earlier lectures, is split up into the caller saved register state and the callee saved register state. The caller saved registers are saved before calling another function, right? The caller has to be saving these registers if it wants to retain them. This includes all of the temporary registers, the argument registers and the return value registers. The callee, the function that was called, is responsible for saving the saved registers and the return address. Functions are implemented through two main instructions. The jump and link instruction that calls a function and saves the return address into the return address register. And the jump register with the argument the return address that returns from that a function back to the callee to the caller. So a quick review, if we look at the assembly for a basic function, we'll see that they all follow a similar structure. So imagine a function foo that calls bar. Foo will then load whatever arguments it wants into the address to the argument registers, save all of the caller save registers that it needs, and then call a jump and link to the function bar. When it returns and foo wants to return itself, it uses a, ju a jump register with the return address at the end. So if we show a simple function here, bar, we can see how this might be implemented. For MIPS, this simple function compiles to something quite easy to understand. We have just four instructions here. A load immediate that loads 41 into the register, 
And then we add the argument and the value 41 and then store it in the return, ad return value register v0 and then jump a jump register to the return address to return back to the caller of this function. And note that we have to always have our delay slots in place here because of the MIPS architecture defines it that jumps and certain other instructions require an extra cycle before they will complete. So this NOP will be executed, but in this case, it's doing nothing. Whenever we want to save and restore registers, we do this by placing them on the stack. And the basic way we do this is by two operations that we refer to in most architectures as pushing and popping elements from the stack. So in MIPS, there's no single instruction that does this. Instead, we subtract from the stack. In this case, we want to save two registers, T1 and T2. We subtract eight because these registers are four bytes each. And the stack is growing down, so it's not an add when you're growing the stack. So we subtract. We then save these two registers into the stack. And then when we want to restore, we simply load them from the stack and add eight. Remember that each stack frame corresponds to a single function and the, these stack frames can grow a bit when we add push and pop elements for saving any spilled state before calling another function. So let's define a few things before we walk through our first example. And the first thing we need to define is the notion of a context. So specifically an execution context is the environment where a function executes. It includes all the arguments, the local variables, and memory. You can think of a context as containing a set of unique CPU registers and a stack pointer in most implementations. There are multiple con execution contexts in a given operating system. You'll at least have an application context where the application thread runs, a kernel context where the kernel thread that might correspond to an application thread or to other threads of execution belonging to the kernel run, and sometimes an interrupt context specifically for interrupts. In many cases, the kernel and interrupt contexts are usually the same. In addition, we can transition between these contexts. Remember that the application context going to the kernel context is one of those mode switches we talked about, going from user mode to privilege mode. So here, we're doing a context switch. This is a transition between these contexts. In addition, we can also have a thread switch. This is a transition between two contexts of the same type. So if you have user level threading, a thread switch could occur between an application context and another one. But in the context of OS161, thread switches always occur between kernel contexts. So we'll see as we work through our example for the rest of the lecture that the way this works is when we switch between different processes or different threads belonging to processes, the application context is interrupted somehow, which does a context switch into the kernel and then a thread switch that allows us to switch to a different kernel context before then returning back to user space into the application context. So now let's start with our basic example. Here, we have a view of the application stack. And I'm generally just gonna list the function names inside of each stack frame that are being executed. All the state that's inside of the stack frame is defined by the compiler, so we don't precisely know what's laid out. The programs, when you write almost all programs in C, usually have an internal function called underscore start that will be the first instru instruction to be executed when a program is loaded. Then that function usually initializes some internal state of the system of the application and then calls the main, the function that you usually assume is the first function to run in your application. In our example, we're gonna have main called printf. Printf is a library function. It's not a system call. 
it's going to do some operations, parse the string, generate a single string that has all the formatting necessary, and then it's going to call write to actually write the string out to the console. So what happens at this point? How does this work? So what's going to happen is that somehow write is going to trigger a system call instruction, which is going to call an exception handler. In OS161, this exception handler is called the common exception function, which will take care of figuring out that we're coming from user space, switching to the kernel stack, and then pushing a trap frame that contains all of the CPU state belonging to the user application. This is an assembly routine that immediately calls MIPS trap once all of the kernel stack and necessary CPU registers are initialized safely. MIPS trap will determine the cause of the trap and then realize that this is a system call and call the syscall in function. Syscall then determines what kind of system call it is by looking inside of v0 and calling sys underscore write in this case to correspond to the write call that the user was trying to make. And it's not too important what happens, but what's gonna happen in OS 161 is that this is gonna call into the console driver to write to the screen to show you the output of your application. Once the console driver completes updating the screen, it'll return back its return value to syswrite. Syswrite stores that return value with the successor failure flag in A3 and V0. Return to syscall, right? A3 will contain a, a zero on a failure or a one for a success, and V0 will contain the return value or the error code of what happened. This will return to MIPS trap. And then finally, it will return to the common exception assembly routine that'll restore all of the CPU state by popping it off the trap frame and returning back to the user application. The user application, as we mentioned, is going to parse v0 and a3, and then it's gonna update the error no variable with the error code if there was an error. This is a common global variable. It's actually a thread local variable in most systems today that contains the error code of the resulting system call. The return value then can be returned back all the way to printf and eventually back to your, hand, your code in main. So for the rest of the lecture, we're gonna look at a little more complicated example that's driven by an interrupt, not a system call. And this is interesting because this really bring, this starts to bring us into the idea of scheduling. We're gonna go into scheduling in more detail in the future, but scheduling is the idea of how do we pick which process to run when. Typically the operating system will be running many more threads and many more processes than there are processors in your, in your system. So by switching between all of these threads very rapidly, we can give you the illusion that all of them are running concurrently. A really basic algorithm that we'll use just to think about for today is that all of the processes or threads can be placed on a round robin or first in first out queue of runnable threads. The code for this can be seen in th kern thread thread.c. In the future lectures, we'll see how we can do with priorities and other algorithms that might give you better benefits. The way that the scheduler runs to decide when to run other things is through this idea of preemption that we mentioned in an earlier lecture. Preemption is the process by which the kernel gets control and is able to take forcefully control away from an application. In the case of a running process, this could occur during a system call. Maybe you call a system call asking it to yield, or your system call calls, causes this thread to go to sleep, or servicing a page fault, or other things that'll cause this thread to no longer be runnable, allowing other threads to then run. Another common way that this happens is through the periodic timer interrupt. 
Typically, the operating system will set up the timer to trigger periodically. In a, often, this is about 10 milliseconds. And it's going to run the scheduler to decide which thread to run next. Here, we can see what happens when we switch between two processes in an operating system. First, we start by executing process zero that then is going to receive a timer interrupt or system call that's going to allow the kernel to take control and run. The kernel decides that it's going to run another process. And what happens is another switch. We first had this context switch from users mode to kernel mode. Now we have a thread switch where we save and load the process state of P0 and re replacing it with the process state of P1. We then have a context switch back to run P1, and P1 can run until another interrupt or system call triggers this process in reverse. And we don't just have to have two processes, we could have any number of processes that we switch between. So we can see here that this is a two-step process this context switch step between user mode and kernel mode, and a thread switch, which is really just another type of context switch between two kernel threads, between the kernel thread that corresponds to P0 and the kernel thread that corresponds to P1. The context switches themselves are very machine dependent, but they come down to really saving the program counter and any important registers. And this is usually pretty much all the registers are saved and restored. Some of these might be done lazily, floating point registers, vector registers, some condition codes are all gonna be saved and restored. And finally, also changing the virtual memory mappings, the translations between virtual and physical memory. And these context switches really amount to a non-negligible cost. Saving and restoring floating point registers and vector registers can often be more, much more expensive than the rest of the register state. And often these can be done lazily by deciding if a process is not using any of the floating point state, well, we just won't save and restore its floating point registers. And second is that Changing the virtual address space requires flushing the TLB. This is the hardware that does the memory translations. And when we talk about virtual memory, we'll get into this in more detail. But this flushing is gonna cause a penalty because one, it's usually costly to flush the memory mappings. We might wanna to try to retain the kernel mappings in some architectures and when the new process is running, we're going to slowly be reloading the TLB with mappings. And so there's a penalty at the very initial start of the new process starting to run after a thread switch. And usually this is going to cause more cache misses also, because once we switch from one program to another, we're switching the working set. One application was touching some regions of memory. The other application has its own independent memory. So we'll have to throw away some of the memory that was cached and load in the new cache data. So momentarily after the context switch, we'll see extra penalties due to cache misses and the TLB overhead. Let's start by assuming that we're in the same process we were in earlier. We're somewhere inside the main function executing some code and a timer interrupt goes off. This is gonna trigger the same common exception handler that's gonna then decide that we're in user space, switches to the kernel stack belonging to the current process, and then place a trap frame on that stack to save all of the CPU state, the context of the application. This is then gonna call immediately MIPS trap, the general trap handler and it's gonna look at the coprocessor to ask what the status is that caused this. What is the, the source of this exception? In this case, it's XIRQ, which is the interrupt exception code. This is gonna trigger OS161, then calling the main bus interrupt handler. Main bus is the generic bus that all devices in Sys161 run off of. 
this handler's basic job is going to be to look through all the devices and figure out which device caused this interrupt. It's going to see immediately that it's the timer interrupt, and it's then going to call timer underscore interrupt. This is not uncommon in most OSs to see some kind of bus interrupt handler that will then be able to determine which actual device triggered the interrupt. The timer interrupt basically job is going to be to call the CPU scheduler. The CPU scheduler essentially is executed by calling thread yield that causes the current thread to temporarily go to sleep, but it'll stay on the runnable queue and allow another thread to run. Thread yield in turn calls thread switch. Thread switch, we can think of this again as a type of context switch. It's gonna generate what's known as a switch frame. We saw this a little earlier that when thread switch runs, it saves only some of the CPU registers because it's gonna be switching between two kernel stacks that are both basically trusted to follow the ABI that was defined by the calling convention for the MIPS architecture. The switch frame saves the minimal state and then switches from one kernel stack to the kernel stack of the target thread, the thread that was decided by the CPU scheduler to switch to. Thread switch continues running now on this new stack and it's gonna reload all of the registers from the switch frame. It's gonna then return back to thread yield, assuming that the other process was a timer interrupt. The timer interrupt is gonna return back all the way to MIPS trap and eventually to the common exception handler. And again, the common exception handler usually will return back to the other application that was selected by the scheduler. We've put all this together to see how basically OS161 and operating systems more generally implement system calls and thread switches. You see that this is a more complicated process this is gonna lead into our discussions on virtual memory and scheduling. Where we're gonna to get to go, we're gonna understand in more detail all the mechanics behind the scenes for all of the steps we saw today.